Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll get started. There'll be a few stragglers coming in, but it's fine. So, final afternoon of the final day of NDC. Hope everyone has had a good conference so far. Excellent. Hope you're well fed. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about Docker today. Uh, briefly, who am I? I'm Shahid Iqbal. I'm a freelance, hands-on consultant working with Azure, .NET, and Kubernetes projects, and I also run kind of Docker and Kubernetes workshops. I'm um, a developer, I've been for over 10 years, I'm Microsoft MVP, and I'm based in the UK, although I tend to work uh, pretty much wherever. I also co-organize a meetup in the UK, and I was trying to take an opportunity when I was speaking to people to encourage them to get into speaking. Um, so if you're sitting there thinking maybe I should do this, uh, I'd highly encourage you to get in touch with the meetup organizers, submit like a lightning talk, that's how I got started two years ago, and um, I've never looked back really. The main reason for the slide is my contact details. So we'll see how we do for time in terms of questions. Um, I was running a little bit over when I practiced this, so we'll see. I'm around for the rest of the day, but there's not, not a huge amount of time left. So if I don't get to your questions, do grab me afterwards. If not, feel free to get in touch with me on any one of those mechanisms. So what are we going to cover today? So we're going to talk about container background. What are they? Um, why you might want to use them? We'll spend a bit of time on how you can do certain things with containers. I'll touch on Windows containers as well, and then we'll, we'll finish with uh, a brief conversation about orchestration. So I'm making some assumptions about this talk, that you are very new to Docker. Hands up if you're new to Docker. Great, okay, this is, this is the target audience. Or you have some basic knowledge of Docker, but not a huge amount. Okay, good. If you know Docker, you've used it in, to any great extent, there's going to be nothing new here except maybe one thing. So if you want to uh, go and find another session, no problems at all. Um, it's going to be quite a fast-paced session because I'm going to cover most of the content I do as day one of my workshop in an hour. So um, what we're going to try and do today is give you enough information so that you can go away and dive a lot deeper into the concepts I'll cover. So. If you don't get some of the things I'm talking about, that's absolutely fine. There'll just be enough, hopefully, that when you go and read the docs or you go and have a play around, it'll click into place. So containers, they're not actually anything new. We've, we've heard about containers for a long time now. Certainly in the last couple of years, we've seen this huge explosion of people talking about containers. Uh, containers are built upon a couple of low-level constructs within the Linux kernel that have been around for a long time, particularly C groups and namespaces. So namespaces essentially allow you to virtualize um, resources for a process, and then C groups allow you to limit the, the, res the resources that uh, have access, so things like CPU memory. The problem with those two constructs is they're quite low level, and they're not the easiest things to use. So what Docker did was they essentially took those primitives and packaged them up into a product, made it much easier to use, and this is what we saw as a kind of explosion into, uh, of container adoption and Docker, uh, in particular, was right at the front of that. But what are containers? So I always say, let's think of them as lightweight VMs. And you notice the, the asterisks. So they don't have the same isolation guarantees that containers, sorry, that uh, VMs give you. And there's caveats to that as well, but let's, let's assume that's the, that's the fact. But they, as far as you're concerned, that's the best way to think about them, in my opinion. What they allow you to do is package your application, along with its dependencies, into a self-contained image. Unlike VM images, container images are generally much, much smaller. And they're much faster to start. So whereas VMs could take minutes to start, container images typically start within a second or a couple of seconds. Containers share the operating system kernel. And because of this, depending on the operating system you're using, you can get a lot of savings in terms of not having to pay additional licenses. One of the key differences when you switch to containers is your CI system is now going to be producing containers rather than your traditional build artifacts. So instead of MSIs or zip files, you're going to be producing containers. So I said containers are like VMs, so let's have a, have a look at a comparison. So on the left-hand side, left yep, for you as well. I'm not very good on my left and the right, so just thought I'd check. We have um, 
classic infrastructure. So this could be you know, the cloud provider, this could be on-prem. We have a host operating system. Then we have this hypervisor, and this hypervisor is the layer which gives you the isolation guarantees that VMs have. And then we have our VMs. So each VM has a guest operating system, has some binaries and libraries that your application is using, and then your application code itself. And every time we want to run a VM, we replicate the guest OS, and then we have our binaries and libraries, and we have our application code. And that's great, because now our binaries are not shared between these two, so we, we don't have any concerns about things kind of cross-talking or version dependency problems. When we look at the Docker world, we start with exactly the same. We have the infrastructure, we have the operating system, but now we have this Docker engine. And the Docker engine is essentially doing the work of the hypervisor, but not to quite the same extent. Now our applications, our containers, our contain have our application code and our binary libraries as before. But you can see we're not duplicating the operating system every time. So it means our containers are smaller, and um, therefore they're quicker to start and easier to move around. So why would I want to use containers? I've touched on it already. One of the key benefits is isolation. Because containers encapsulate all of the dependencies your application uses, it means that you can deploy them and you, alongside other um, containers which have different dependencies. And you're not going to have any concerns about things cross-talking or things interfering with each other. As I've said, they're lighter weight because they don't share, they don't have a copy of the OS in every single um, container. You don't have to virtualize the whole stack, so now you can run more than one container on a, on a machine. So you're getting better utilization of your hardware. They're faster to start, touched on this already. And then importantly, they're portable. So they will run anywhere that you have a container runtime. This makes things like provisioning servers much easier. So whereas in the past, you may have to provision a VM and then have to install a load of dependencies onto that VM, you now need essentially a vanilla VM because most uh, operating system providers now have Docker support built into them. So you provision a vanilla VM and then you can start running your containers. You don't have to give somebody a long script of how to install various dependencies or have your own scripts, hopefully PowerShell scripts or whatever you're using. So it fixes that works on my machine problem. So where you have an application that works on one server and doesn't work on another, that should be gone when you switch to containers. There's a significant benefit to the developer workflow. Developers can now run multiple versions of frameworks without worrying about conflicts. There's a lot less setup, so much like the server example, on a dev machine, how many people have started a new job and are given a, a Word file or some chocolatey script they have to run to install all of the dependencies that they need for their dev machine? If you're using the containers, you don't need to have any of the dependencies on the machine itself. You can potentially just get started by running some containers. So this means it's for front-end folks. They don't need to have access to a dev back-end environment. They don't need to have access to the internet, potentially. They can do their front-end work while accessing a container running the back-end code on their local machine. So they can work on the plane, for example. And for front-end, sorry, for back-end folks, means we don't need to install NPM anymore. Yay. No more downloading the internet into our NPM folder. Um, I'm going to talk about VS Code in this context a bit later. It'll feel a bit weird. Why did I switch away and I come back? It's because I want to do a demo specifically around VS Code, and it fits better when it's done later on. So um, we'll see more about this developer workflow later on. So we'll talk about Docker. Is Docker the only container technology out there? And the short answer is no, there's actually quite a few. So Rocket was one of the most well-known ones. It's actually recently been archived by the CNCF. Uh, it's Kata Containers, and there's several others as well. So each of these have slightly different specializations, and some are compatible with Docker, some aren't. And with that in mind, there's been this open container initiative, which is a collaboration between Docker and a number of other companies, trying to essentially standardize and create an open standard around container formats and container runtimes. So what this should let you do is run container containers with the runtime. If it's OCI compliant, you don't need to worry about the specific flavors and what you're using. You pick whatever suits your technology requirements. So far, I've been talking about containers and images, and we've been sometimes switching between them. 
So what's the difference? Well, the image is the blueprint. So image is your template. So for, for developers out there, the image is your class. Okay? And the container is a running instance of that image. So you can create multiple containers from a single image. And that's what you would typically do if you wanted to scale out your application, for example. These images are made up of layers. And the layers become really important because what it allows you to do is build an image on top of another image. And because la these layers are on your system, they are cached and they can be reused. And this means that you don't have to have, um, it doesn't use as much disk space and also makes pulling images um, and sending images to the cloud a lot quicker. You still need a decent connection to be fair. The layers within an image are read only, but when you run a container, you get a read-write file system on top of those layers. So what do I mean by that? Let's, let's take a closer look. So in this uh, example here, we've got a rather old Ubuntu image, and this is the, what's what we call the base image. And then we've got layers. Each one of these layers was an instruction within a Docker file, and we'll see what those are in a minute. And each one's got a, a, a special hash, and they're layered on top of each other. So this could have been installing some dependency, this could have been creating a folder, this could have been adding a file, this could have been something else. So we're, we're layered upon there. If we then created another image that also used Ubuntu and also used the same dependency, we would re reuse this layer. We wouldn't have to have another copy of this 188 megs. So talking about this read-write layer, let's talk briefly about state. So within a container, you have a file system. You have a local file system. As I say, it, it looks like a, like a virtual machine. And when I do a demo, hopefully I'll show you how you can even get in there and have a look. But it's important to understand that the, the state that you put into a container is ephemeral. It will be gone when the container is removed. So if you need to write state to your local disk, you need to use something called volumes. Very briefly, volumes is a, a component that allows you to share state um, beyond the lifetime of a container. This state, this volume, can be shared between multiple containers as well. And you can mount this um, share, if you like, this volume, as read-write, read-only, and even as a temporary. The really nice thing with volumes is you can also mount a local file system into a container. So then you can share files that are on your actual host operating system inside the container as well, and make changes that reflect both ways. So I touched on the workflow and how the workflow changes. So let's have a look at that. So as a developer, I write my code and I commit that code to source control. Hopefully we're all using source control now, but this is not the, the early 90s. Um, we kick off some kind of build system, and the build system now creates a container, and we push that container to a registry. And we'll talk about registries a little bit later. That container is then deployed onto some kind of container host so that's our new workflow. Now it's worth pointing out there are some, and most container registries allow you to build code directly from the source control. I'm not a fan of that, I prefer the build system way because I have a little bit more control. Maybe I'm a control freak, but I like having control over the build system. I can do more interesting things or more useful things, whereas the source control uh, to container registries typically a git trigger. So you commit your code, that triggers, and that triggers a build. That works fine if you've got really simple uh, use cases, actually. So how do we build an image? How do we get started with Docker, actually? So I use Docker for desktop, or Docker desktop, as they call it now, for Windows. There's Mac version available as well. And this installs the Docker engine and also the CLI. It's free to use, um, and you can download it at that URL there. Once you have that installed, you have the CLI and you have the Docker engine. I'll show you the, I'll show you the Docker tooling briefly when we do a demo. So when we want to create an image, we have to create a Docker file. And essentially, a Docker file is just a text file. And it describes the steps to build a container. Each line in the Docker file will create a new layer in that Docker file, sorry, in the image. And by convention, this Docker file is called Docker file. It has no extension and it lives in the root of the project. The order of the statements in a Docker file are important, and we'll have a look at why in a second. So this is an example of a Docker file. This is a .NET Core Docker file, and 
let's have a let's have a work th let's work through it. So this uh, before I go too much further, this is what we call a multi-stage build. If you've seen Docker talks from two three years ago, people weren't talking about multi-stage builds. Then a year ago, people were talking about this new thing called multi-stage builds. Now everything should be a multi-stage build. So this is how Docker files all to should look or or some some variant of. So right at the top here, we've got the from command. The blue commands are the Docker commands, by the way. We're using a base image here, and this is a .NET Core SDK base image. And we're calling this the build environment. We're setting a working directory. And now we're copying the csproj file. And we're doing .NET restore. So for those people who aren't .NET, um, .NET familiar, this is like copying uh, packages.config and doing npm restore. Now we copy the rest of the code and we run .NET publish using release configuration and we want the output to go into a particular folder. So this first set of commands is for building the code. Now what we're doing is we're building the image that we're gonna to use to run. So now we're doing another from command. This time we're using a different image and I'll talk about the difference in a second. All we're doing here is we're setting a working directory. We're copying the outputs from this section. So this build env is this up here. We're copying that and we're putting it into an app out folder. Sorry, that's the out folder, sorry, from there. Then we're saying the entry point, this is telling the container what to run when it starts. So it's gonna run .NET and it's gonna run my DLL. This .NET command is built into, is in, in a part of the container. Why do we have these two containers? Well, this one is the SDK container. This contains lots of tools that I need to build my code. When I'm running my code, I don't need all of those tools. I don't need debuggers, I don't need various other things. I just want to run my code. And my code, my image for my code should be as small as possible. It should also has, have as few tools as possible because each tool is potentially a uh, security risk. Low, you know, lower the surface area, the better. So that's what's, what's going on there. Now I said earlier that the order of the statement is really important. And if you were looking at this Docker file, I'm wondering, this is a bit weird. Why are we copying the csproj file, doing a restore, and then copying everything again? It's a little bit weird. When you use these Docker files, each, uh, and you run them for the first time, each of these is executed and a layer is created. When you continue to work with these files, if you don't make any change on a particular file, for example, that layer is reused. So what we're doing here is because NuGet packages typically aren't the most frequently changing thing in a project. Usually it's your code. By, by copying the CS project and doing the .NET restore, what we're doing here is we're caching that layer so that the .NET restore is typically one of the slower, slower steps within a build. What this means is that when we continue to work with our code, the steps up to here are cached. We're not, we're not rerunning them, so they're a lot faster. And then all we're doing is copying our code, doing the publish, and then moving on. So that becomes really important and it's worth bearing that in mind. Your specific use case may differ. Um, you'll see this commonly with NPM again, because NPM is quite heavyweight. So how do I build a Docker file? Well, once I have that Docker file, all I need to do is in my command line, I run docker build, I do dash t and I give this tag, and we'll talk about tags in a second. Then I point to the Docker file. Now, if you're stuck with the conventions and you're in the root folder, then all you would do is docker build. This is my tag in this example. And this dot here saying is basically the current folder. So that means that my Docker file is in the current folder and it's called Docker file with no extensions. If your Docker file is somewhere else and you've renamed it, then you just supply the path and the name there. And what that will do is that will build um, the image. So what are these tags are mentioned? So tags really are a combination of the name of the image plus a version. And the, it can be a bit confusing when you use the tooling because tags are sometimes referred to the whole thing. But generally speaking, we would talk about tags as the bit after the colon. So for example, here in this Microsoft one, we have .NET Core runtime, and then the tag is version three. Now it's possible to create an image without specifying this colon three bit. And when we do that, we're basically creating what's called a latest image. Latest images are great if you don't want to have to constantly update tag numbers in, in certain scenarios. 
but they're very dangerous in production because when you run an image without specifying a specific tag, it means that if somebody rebuilds that image, you will automatically get that new image without realizing you were going, you intended to do that. So you must always specify a tag when you're running these kinds of things in any kind of production environment. Tag naming is hard um, because you have to factor two things in this. So you've got your code changes. So sometimes people say, what should I put in my tag? Well, it could be V1, that's my, my version of my application. But of course, you're gonna be deploying multiple times on V1. So maybe I use you know, major minor patch build number. And that could work. Except, as I said, these images are built on base layers. And the base layer may be some kind of operating system or some kind of framework. And if that framework has a bug and it has to be patched, then you need to rebuild your image. Your code hasn't changed, but the image is a new image. So one of the best candidates for this is build ID. So take an ID from your CI system what this will let you do is track back to any container. You can track it back, so any image, you track it back to where it was built. And from there, you should be able to see what caused that, whether it was a code change, whether it was a framework update of a base image. So I've got my image. How do I run it? Do Docker run. Give it the name of the image. It's the most simplistic way of doing that. There are a number of parameters here. I've listed only a handful there. Uh, we'll have a look at this when we do the demo. So for example, I can specify a name um, for this particular container. So now I'm running the image to create a container. Dash D runs it in detached or daemon mode. This means it will run in the background. And again, we'll have a look at this in a second. Dash P allows me to specify a local port on my machine and how that maps to a port within the container. This lets me send traffic from my local machine into the container if I'm running, for example, a web browser. Okay, so talk about registries. How do I push my images to a registry? So Docker, this is simply Docker push, and then the name of the image. Now, it's not that straightforward, because depending on which registry you're pushing to, you often have to tag the registry, the name of the repository, then the image name, and then the version. So for example, here, I'm re-tagging my local image to be the name of my repository on Docker Hub, and I'll talk about Docker Hub in a second, then the name of the actual image, then the version. Once I've done that, I can then push it registry. You have to make sure you're logged in and everything else, but you can do that all from the command line. So these registries, think of them as repositories for your container images. So maybe not quite GitHub, but say NuGet. NuGet for container images. They can be public or private. And as I said, most of them support actually building the container images as well. Docker Hub is the default that's built in. That's what the tooling would default to. But you can connect to any other registry. So every cloud provider has their own. The Azure Container Registry is, is another option if you're on Azure. And it has some additional benefits like geo-replication of your images, for example. So if you're running geo geographically dispersed, Azure Container Registry will, will replicate your image so that when you pull it, it's, it's a lot faster. So let's have a quick kind of demo of a variety of container stuff. Couldn't think of a bad name. So I've got the tooling installed, and it gives me this Mobi icon down here. And it's a little bit small, but if I open that up, we can see there's some settings here. Now the Docker tooling also enables Kubernetes, but we won't talk about that now. We'll touch on that a bit later. The key thing you're looking for is Docker is running down here. It's a little bit small, hopefully people can see that. Once I've got that, what I can do is I come over to a command line and I can just check that it's running. So if I just do Docker, I get a load of stuff. So these are all the kind of commands I have in Docker. I can have a look at the images I've got at the moment. So one of the challenges of doing a Docker talk in a conference is you potentially rely on conference Wi-Fi for pulling large amounts of data. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. So I've pulled some images already, and I've been using Docker for a while, so there's quite a lot here. So you can see these are some of the images I've got, uh, some I've been building. 
And see, the, there's a variety. There's some .NET OSDK stuff there. There's some of my own. So how do I run container? So rather than you having to watch me type, I'm just going to copy a command, and then I'll talk through the command just because it's quicker. So let me copy this line here. I'm going to read ahead now and see what I'm going to talk about. I think I've got that all here. So before I run it, I'll talk through. Can everyone see that clearly? Good. So Docker run, dash IT is essentially saying run it interactive. It's not quite that straightforward, but, but for the purpose of this talk, that'll do. Dash RM says remove it once I'm finished. This is that dash P I said, mapping the port. So what we're doing here is we're mapping port 8000 on my local machine to port 80 inside the container. I've given it a name. Then I'm pulling this .NET core sampled ASP.NET app. So when I run that, that's the container running. Okay, so we can see some of the log outputs. If I now come over to a browser, just close that a second. If I go to localhost, go to port 8000, I see the app. So I'm running that container. Now I didn't need to have, I'm a developer, I've got .NET Core on this machine, but I didn't need to have any of that stuff on this machine. This could have been a brand new machine with nothing on it whatsoever. It could still run an ASP.NET Core free application. This is running interactively. You see, I'm, my terminal is blocked at the moment. I can't do anything else. So if I just kill that a second, I can have a look at containers which are running. So if I do Docker PS, I can see that there are no containers running at the moment. That's because I just killed that one because I ran it interactively. So let me run this again, but this time all I'll do is I'll change IT, and I'll change it to, to detached mode. So I'll do D. Now you'll see that my command line returns, and I can carry on doing whatever I want. But I've been given this long hash. If I now do docker ps, I can see actually my container is running. It's just running in the background now. So I come back to that page. I can refresh that, and it's still working fine. Now let's say I wanted to have a look at the logs. And there are a number of ways of doing this, but let's say I wanted to explore this container a little bit. What I can do is I can do docker exec, oops, exec dash it, I can give it the name of the container. If I can copy this. And I can tell it what, what I want to run. So I'm gonna run a little bash terminal. So right now, what I've done is I've essentially SSH'd into this container. So now I can do ls in here. We can see this is an ASP.NET Core application. We can see if I do cat app settings.json, we can see that's my app setting. So I'm now inside this container. So I can explore it. I can try and figure out what's going wrong. And if I do exit, I'm now back out of the container. That container is still running. But I just I was in there temporarily. So I think that was all of the demos I wanted to do on the Docker files. Uh, so let's have a look at building a container. So what I've got in one of these Visual Studio windows is a ASP .NET Core file new project. And I actually opened this in Visual Studio. And Visual Studio gives you the option to add Docker support. I'm opening it in VS Code because it's a bit easier to make the, the uh, view bigger. So this is the Docker file that actually uh, uh, Visual Studio has added for me. And you can see it's a little bit different to the one I showed you, but it's not, not too bad. It's not too dissimilar. There's the entry point. Here's our, here's our main copying of the uh, project. Here's the restore. So it's broadly the same. It's just they've added a few extra steps. What I can do now is if I, oops, not that one. If I come over to there, it's all going wrong. If I now um, see where it is, so it's in, hello. So you can see the uh, Docker file is there. So now I should be able to do docker build dash t, and I'll call this um, 
hello NDC, and I just do a dot. What that's going to do now is that's going to run through and build. And see how fast that was? That's because I've run this before and it's cached. Can you see this? So it says using cache, using cache, using cache, using cache. If I come back into VS Code and let's change something. Let's change index. Let's change this. It's traditional to have hello. And I've never done hello NDC in a demo before, so I'm going to go crazy this time. So I'm going to change that. Let's come back to here and let's rerun that build. What we see now is it won't be quite as fast. You see now it's doing that build again, but it cached the layers prior to that. So there's that using cache, using cache, using cache. So hopefully that really emphasizes that point. Once it's finished, here we are. Now I can run this if I want. So we do Docker run and let's map port, uh, I'll run that as detached mode, I'll map port uh, 8080, because the other one is still running, I think, to port, port 80. And I will, uh, what did I call it, hello NDC, I think. Actually went off script a little bit there, so we'll see if I've screwed this up. I think we're good. So if I now change this to 8080, we should see the, the image I've just built Right there, that's not, oh, that's cached, I think. That's for a later demo, there we are, cool. So you can see that was the image I've just built on my machine. I could now go and push that to the container registry. I'm not gonna do that here because that would be relying on the Wi-Fi. That might be slightly crazy. Um, so I think that was all the demos on that side. Let's see if I, yeah, and let's carry on. So far, we've been talking about predominantly um, containers, but in the context, actually, there have been Linux containers. So there are actually also Windows containers. So Windows containers allow you to create containers on Windows using the same tooling that, and the same syntax that you're used to with standard containers. So what Windows containers allow you to do is, one example is to dockerize existing full .NET Framework applications and put them into a container. Now .NET Framework is a OS dependency. This is where you start having issues if you have um, some old application that's looking for .NET 2 and an application that's using a newer version. Now .NET is backwards compatible, so in theory it should work. But I think most people I know, they end up running another VM just to keep that isolation. If you dockerize those Windows containers, uh, put those applications into Windows containers, run them on the same machine, you're no longer at risk of any kind of crossover, but now you can save Windows licenses because you're running fewer machines. One thing to bear in mind with Windows containers is the image sizes are substantially larger. Um, we'll hopefully see an example of this later. So from the user's point of view, the Docker client, the CLI we're using is the same. And then essentially we're targeting a different operating system. So the daemon is the same and then on Windows, we essentially get Windows Server or Linux containers. Now, Linux containers work on Windows. Uh, typically on a dev machine, what's actually happening is there's a Linux VM running on your behalf. Um, in the later versions of Windows, there's a thin wrapper around the Linux containers, and it's something called LCAL that you may hear about. With Windows containers, we have a few more options and a few more decisions we have to make. So when it comes to uh, the containers, we have some operating system choices. So here's my physical machine again. This is a host operating system. So now we have a choice between Windows Server 2016 or above, or Windows 10 Pro Enterprise. That's what I'm using. You don't use that for any kind of production environment, but for testing, for development, you can do that. Now within our container, we have a choice of two operating systems. We can use Windows Server Core and Nano Server. Nano Server is a new-ish version of Windows that's been heavily um, cut back to reduce its size, reduce its surface area. It was actually originally intended to be a fully fledged server operating system, but a few years ago, the decision was made to turn it into essentially a container operating system only. So which guest operating system do we use? So Nano Server is 64-bit only. It doesn't have full .NET framework. 
So essentially, this is something you'd want to use for new applications or services. Windows Server Core, however, is essentially the full Windows Server. So you can use this for creating or, or containerizing legacy, sorry, legacy, I should always put in quotes, it's not legacy, full .NET Framework applications. So you get the whole um, stack. I think the only thing missing is the fax driver. So if you're in that business, then sorry, containers are probably not for you, but otherwise, you should be good. So we have two operating system choices. We also have two container flavors within um, Windows. So we have the standard Windows containers and we have something called Hyper-V containers. So remember I said that containers don't give you the same level of isolation as VMs? Sometimes you have requirements, regulatory requirements that say you must have hypervisor isolation between running applications. Or if you're running somebody else's code and you don't trust it at all, you may need this extra isolation. It is possible to break out of a container if containers have not been properly patched and the operating system has not been properly patched. So Windows containers can run in two modes. So we have the kind of standard Windows containers, if you like. So now we've got the infrastructure, we've got the operating system, we've got the engine, and here's our standard Windows Server containers. So like we saw with the Docker containers, the Linux containers rather, got your app and your binary, no problem. With the Hyper-V container, we're getting essentially another Windows kernel. So we're now isolating the Windows kernel specifically for that container. That gives us extra isolation if we want to, if we need to run something that needs that level of isolation. So does this mean I have to build a different version of a container to do that? And the short answer is no. So you're using the same container image as you were before, but when you run it, you add an extra flag. So you now add isolation equals Hyper-V. Behind the scenes, what's happening is a very lightweight VM is being spun up, put around the container, and that's how you're getting this isolation. So containers with Hyper-V isolation do incur additional Windows licenses, because you're getting another copy of that kernel, so you do have to pay additional licenses. The startup time for a Hyper-V container is slightly slower, but it's only a few seconds. It's, it's maybe another second or two to the startup time. The overhead is slightly higher as well, but it's still much faster and less resource intensive than running four VMs. Okay. So I said earlier that I was gonna, I was talking about Visual Studio, the, I was talking about the uh, developer workflow and I said I'll come back to uh, something to the Visual Studio code. And that's about now. So there's a feature added to Visual Studio code not so long ago, which allows you to use containers as a development environment. So essentially what you're doing is using Visual Studio code to run a development environment that's hosted entirely inside the container. So this is really cool because as a dev machine, as I touched on earlier as well, you don't need to have anything on your local machine. And you can even work on a remote Docker host. So this means if you've got a lightweight machine, anything that can run the Docker CLI, even if you can't run the full Docker um, backend because you don't have enough resources, you can use Visual Studio Code Remote containers and connect to a remote Docker host. Windows containers are not currently supported on this, but hopefully they're coming. So how does this work? Essentially, Visual Studio Code has a server component, and inside the container, that spins up and handles a lot of the, uh, the legwork. From the local operating system point of view, the VS Code is essentially just running, um, connecting back, end to the, back to the server through the container, and your source code is on the local machine, but that volume is being mounted into the container, and I talked about that earlier when we mount the file system. So we'll do a demo of this later, uh, and very soon actually. I just want to touch on one of the components so then I can do the uh, handful of demos together. So once you've got your containers, where do you run them? So one option is you spin up a VM and you can just run them on the VM. So as I said, most uh, operating systems now have container support built in. So Windows Server 2016 and above has container support built in. You may have to enable it as an optional feature, but it's there. You can use PaaS services. So in Azure, you've got app service for containers, you got ECS in AWS, and I'm sure there's many others as well. You have these serverless container platforms, so like Azure Container Instances or Fargate. 
And if you need it, you can move towards an orchestration platform. And we'll touch on these a little bit later as well. Something like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. So I mentioned ACI. What is it? It's a, it's a serverless container platform within Azure. So if you want to tick off all the buzzwords, you can tick that one off as well. The nice thing with ACI is you don't need to provision any servers beforehand. You just give ACI your container and tell it to run. You pay per second for that container while it's running. And for anyone who's had a look at ACI in the past, it used to be a little bit expensive. Um, they cut the price a little while ago now, and actually the cost for running a container on ACI 24 seven is comparable to an equivalent sized VM or equivalent sized PaaS SKE. Let's have a look at some demos of these things. So I'm gonna have a look at the Visual Studio Code uh, demo first. So over here, I've downloaded a, a demo of Rust. Now on my machine, I don't have Rust. I don't even know what the Rust tooling is. I'm guessing it's Rust or Rust, I think it's Rust C I've seen. Um, so I have nothing, nothing on this machine. But this folder here contains a special file and it contains a source code. So I pulled this straight off, uh, off GitHub. When I run this in Visual Studio Code, you'll see it pops up down the bottom here. I don't know if you can see that very well. That didn't work. Uh, let's abort that one. It says reopen in container. So when I click on that, what it's going to do now is essentially it's starting to bootstrap a container. And we can have a look at the details here. So it's running a container now and it's bootstrapping that container and essentially what it will do in a few seconds, it will give me the terminal, the IDE, except it's running inside the container. So now I have access to the tooling. So this is, this is a Rust project. And what I can do is I can press F5 and that will run. And we can see down here, it's a little bit small. See down here it says, Hello VS Code Remote Containers, oops, just down there. So I can put a breakpoint if I wanted to. Where's the breakpoint? Yeah, there we are. Breakpoint, I can change this. And I can run that again. I can hit my breakpoint. You can see I've got locals here. You can see the values. If I let that run through. See, it's printed the value down there. I think I can put Rust development on my CV now, um, but that's that's quite cool because I didn't need to have, when you go to start a new project, one of the problems you often run into is I don't have the dependencies and I have to figure out what dependencies I need to install. If you're running an open source project and you have some dependencies, if you enable this feature, you'll actually make your life a lot easier. How does that work actually? Let's have a quick look. So we have this dev container folder and in there, we have this JSON file. And this JSON file is essentially giving the Visual Studio Code some examples of how to run. I've not looked at this before, but this is the magic, if you like. And here's the Docker file it's gonna use. So the uh, documentation for this is great. If you wanna enable this on existing projects, that's what you need to do is essentially add those two files. So that was uh, Visual Studio Remote. Uh, let's have a quick look at the Windows containers. Um, so what I'm going to do is to run Windows containers. My terminal's going a bit funny. Let's just load that there. Right. What I need to do is switch my Docker tooling to Windows containers. So up here it says switch to Windows containers. So when I press that, it's going to kind of whir away for a little bit. It takes a few seconds to switch. And yes, that's going to complain. I should just close that. You can see that looks like it's switched. So now if I do Docker images like I did before, sorry, let me just clear the screen so it's right at the top. If I do Docker images like I did before, you'll see now I only have one image and it's an IAS image. And note what it said about the size, that's 5.4 gigs. This is why I pulled this image before I came down to do this talk and not during this talk. Uh, but I can run this in the same way as I did before. Let me just grab the snippets. I'm not faffing about typing. Um, so it's here. Oh, no, it's not. It's there. 
Now, I'm pretty sure I left the other container running that was banned to port 8080. I can't have more than one mapping to the same port, so I'm gonna change this to 81. So now this is a Windows container running, and you can see it's not quite as fast as the Linux containers. That's fine, it's 5.4 gigs. But it's still not a VM, because any second now, it will start. But because people are watching, it always takes longer. <laughs> there we are. So now if we do Docker PS, we'll see it's running. And I should be able to open a browser. And let's go to localhost 8081. And we should see the IS homepage. So that's Windows Container. Okay, the last demo I wanted to do was just to show you how you can run um, something on ACI. So on Azure Container Instances, I've already created a resource group. That's the standard thing you do on almost everything you create in Azure has a resource group. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run AZ Container Create. Uh, that's the resource group name. I'm giving it a name and I'm pointing it to the image. This is an image that's on Docker Hub. I'm getting a DNS label here, just a friendly label then I'm opening port 80. So when I hit go on that, this should hopefully only take about 30 seconds. Oh dear, it signed me out of, um, yes. I might regret doing this, but let's, it's, uh, it's authentication. Hopefully it won't trigger my multi-factor authentication. Oh, good, okay. I think we're back in business. Just have to wait for it to do its thing. Why can we kill that? Just clear that. Let's try and run that again. Any second now. Um, Conscious of time, but this will this will spin up. I wonder if I should carry on and we can come back to it. We'll do that. We'll come back to it. So once you've got these containers, once you've got these containers, how do you run them? And in particular, how do you run multiple containers? Because often you're not gonna have a single container that you're running. You have a few choices here, where do you run them? You can run multiple containers on a single server if you want. You're more likely in the production scenario to want to run on multiple servers, so a cluster of servers. If you run on a single server, of course, if that server dies, you're gonna lose all of your containers, and that could be a problem. One option, and this is limited to a single server, is to use Docker Compose. So Docker Compose gives you a way of declaring a number of containers you want to use in a YAML file, and you get used to YAML files after a while. You'll lose a day on a white space issue, but eventually get used to them. Um, and essentially what it does is it allows you to spin up multiple containers as a group. So for example, you might have a backend and a front-end service that you want to spin up together, Docker and Compose can allow you to do that. It also creates some networks to help the service discovery between those two services. And this is still a very popular way on developer machines to coordinate services. Even if you use a different orchestrator in production, this is still a very common way of having developer workflows kind of coordinated or when you're testing containers on a local machine. <clears throat> Another option was Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm is essentially running Docker Compose across multiple machines to solve that problem of if a machine dies, do I lose all my containers? Problem with Docker Swarm is it got overtaken by Kubernetes. How many people have heard of Kubernetes? Yeah, pretty much the whole room. So Kubernetes is an open source container orchestrator. It was originally created by Google, but it's now part of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. In a nutshell, essentially it helps you run containers across multiple machines. 
It does more than that. It creates an application platform for you, which has a number of features. So it gives you things like auto-scaling, resilient applications, rolling deployments, and many, many other things. It's quite a beast, though. It's quite complicated. And if you were at my talk yesterday, you know how deep some of the configurations and options can get. So let's finish by having a quick look at um, how we run our container on Kubernetes. And also, let's see if our ACI container is running. So I think it's this one. Yeah. So that's running now. And if I grab this URL, oops, I missed the, I missed the IO. Let's try that again. Well, see, this is a this is a, an image I've been using for ages uh, for various demos. So that's my container image. I'm paying per second while this is running. As soon as I decide I don't want to run it anymore, I shut it down. I stop paying. The difference is if I'd run a VM, it doesn't matter if I'm running containers or not. I'm paying for the VM the whole time it's running. Okay. We're going to take the same image actually, and we're going to run it in Kubernetes now. So I've got a cluster already created. I'm not going to go through what Kubernetes is in any great detail. I'll link to a video I've done in the past, which is a Kubernetes intro talk, which hopefully you can then pick up from. Um, just want to show you how you can run a container in Kubernetes um, without worrying about the details too much. So I've got a command line tool that's connected to a uh, cluster. So I can see how many machines I've got in this cluster. And I've got three machines in this cluster. And if I want to run a container on this cluster, I can do something as simple as run, uh, give it a name, point to the image. This is that same image I've been using in a few of the demos. And tell it what port I'm expecting traffic on. So when I do that, we can ignore the um, warning at the top because for the purpose of this demo, that doesn't matter. I can now have a look, and actually, I've got a container running. You can see it's starting up at the moment. Don't worry about the pods. That will all be explained in the other video. Essentially, think of it as the container. And I've clearly made a mistake because that didn't work. Oh, I missed the SR. That's why. So let me just delete. And that one. Should be right. And we see I've actually pulled this image before, so it's very quick to start. So that's that's one of my containers running on one of those machines. I can actually find out which machine it's running on by doing get pods and then asking for some more information. So I can see that's running on VM number two. See that down there? The problem with this is if that machine dies, what will actually happen is Kubernetes will realize that there should be a container running, and it's not. And it will start running it somewhere else. Now, that may only take a second, but that will be downtime. So I want to run more than one instance. So what I can do is I can scale that deployment I've got. And I'm going to choose three replicas. Whoops, replicas. If I now do get pods, and I do uh, a wide, what we'll see is we're now running, hopefully you can see that, one of these is running on each of those machines. So one and zero, one and one, one and two. Now if one of these machines dies, I wouldn't get any downtime whatsoever. The uh, missing instance will get recreated automatically for me on another machine, and my users wouldn't see any downtime. Kubernetes is a lot more complicated than that. I just wanted to show you a very quickly, quick flavor of how quickly it can be possible to get started. So I think that's the last of the demos. Let's go and wrap up. So containers can dramatically simplify your workflow. This can be your deployment workflow, also your developer workflow. You may want to consider using Windows containers, for example, to manage legacy applications. By containerizing those legacy applications, you can have a consistent approach to managing your old and new applications.
And as I said already, Windows containers can potentially save you money by packing a load of win small Windows services onto a single machine now rather than having lots of different servers because you want to be isolation. Orchestration like Kubernetes is extremely powerful, but it's really, really important to understand that it's not free. It's open source and it's a free project, but it's free like a puppy. So you need to ensure that you have organizational knowledge and you need to understand the cost of running it. There's a complexity there. Every single one of your team, even your dev team, in my, my opinion, needs to have a good understanding of Kubernetes to use it. And I haven't touched on this in this talk because it's so fast paced, but security is really, really important. And security plays a part in numerous places. You have, when you're building your container, you need to think about security. When you're using container images, you need to think about security. When you're running containers, you need to think about security. So security is a talk all by itself. I'm not doing it justice by having it as one bullet point, but I felt I should mention it. So if you want to learn more, Catacode is an amazing online free learning platform where you can go on and have a play with most of these um, cloud native technologies like Docker, like Kubernetes. Uh, all you need is a browser and an internet connection and you don't need to install anything locally. It's fantastic, I love it, and that's where I learned most of what I knew about Kubernetes. If you want to know more about Kubernetes specifically, I did a talk in Oslo last year, which is a beginner's guide. So it essentially picks up from where the containers talk leaves off, uh, finishes. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. The slides are available at that link there. And I think we've got about two minutes to take questions, if anyone's got any. Why? why? Why is Microsoft investing in Windows containers? Because when you have, a, when you have uh, if you have uh, Windows applications and new .NET Core cross-platform Linux applications and you want to put them in a container, you now have to manage two totally different approaches to deploying your application. Whereas if you can put the Windows applications into containers and the Linux applications into containers, run them on the same platform, which actually could be Kubernetes, because now Kubernetes can run Windows containers. And on AKS, you can create hybrid clusters, which have got Windows and Linux nodes on them. You can potentially manage all of your state of applications using one platform, rather than having to have custom scripts for VMs, provisioning, installing frameworks, et cetera, et cetera. That's It has improved significantly, so I didn't touch on it. So you saw that as five, five gigs. So about a year and a half ago, that was 12, 14 gigs. So it's significantly smaller. And the nano image, which I haven't talked about, is around 80 megs, I think. So it's a lot smaller. Um, I see the Windows containers as a stepping stone. So if you've got code that you are actively working on and it's full .NET Framework code, I would encourage you, I would strongly encourage you to port that to .NET Core. That's the only answer, really, for stuff you're actively working on, in my opinion. Stuff you're not working on anymore, you can, it's actually possible to containerize an application that you don't even have the source code for. If you've got an IS deployment, you can actually turn that into a Windows container without having the actual source code. As long as you've got the binaries, you can build an image out of that. Um, yeah, Windows containers have challenges. One is the size. Two is a lot of the modern tooling, a lot of the cooler frameworks that are coming out, like service meshes, don't currently work with Windows containers. They're Linux only. So you'd always, in my opinion, you always feel like you're a step behind. But it's an option that gives you a stepping stone to the future. Answer your question? Cool. Yes. Sure. So the question, the question was, in my AKS demo, I had three nodes. And when I deployed, I, I was only using one node initially. Am I paying for all three nodes? And the answer is yes, I was. You can definitely create a smaller cluster. If you want to use it for production, you have to be careful of the minimum requirements. But you can, and you can scale up the cluster. There's another option which I talked about yesterday, so you may want to catch the video recording, which is something called the virtual node, which allows you to have a node which is essentially serverless. Um, and only, you only pay when you're running containers on there. 
it's really out of the scope of this talk, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if you like. Sure, last question, I think. So the question was, does those, does those containers I was running on um, Kubernetes load balance? And the answer is yes. And in fact, I didn't show you I could have accessed that site. It will load balance across those instances. Yeah, it does. That's one of the out-of-the-box features. Um, I think we're on time. I'm happy to take further questions, but I think we'll let everyone else go. So thank you very much. <laughs>